This video is brought to you by MyBookie.ag. UFC 296 is here. Huge card. A lot of great fights. The main card especially is completely stacked. Prelims are alright. Early prelims are alright. Two championship fights. Multiple contenders. A lot of veterans. Not a lot of prospects. This one is going to be exciting. Of course, the headlining fight is Leon Edwards and Colby Covington. The welterweight title finally is going to get defended again. And hopefully both these guys afterward become a lot more active because we want to see them fight more, man. But it should be a very interesting fight. The odds have been switching up. Colby started as a favorite. Now Leon's the favorite. The co-main event is another title fight in the rematch of Alexander Pantoja versus Brandon Royval. This is going to be a very interesting one to see if Royval actually improved enough to close that gap, which there was a pretty big gap the first time they fought each other. Not a lot of buzz in the co-main, but I think it's one of the best fights on the card. You have Shavkat versus Wonderboy, a potential change of the guard. Wonderboy's been knocking down a lot of the younger guys. Let's see what he could do against Shavkat, who seems to be like the scariest force in the welterweight division. He's essentially like the boogeyman of 170. Tony Ferguson versus Patty Pimblett. Man, that's going to be a tough one to watch. I wonder if Tony could finally step back in the winning column. That would be amazing. We have the two, I don't know if they're friends anymore, but Vicente Luque and Ian Machado Gary going at it. Should be a fun striking match. Josh Emmett going up against Bryce Mitchell, another older guy versus a younger guy. Bryce is taking this up on short notice. Cody Garbrandt's on the card versus Brian Keller, who hasn't fought in ages. Casey O'Neill versus Ariana Lipsky, huge fan of that fight. Alonzo Menafield versus Dustin Jacoby's a great fight. Tagir Ilambukov versus Cody Durden is a fun one. Randy Brown versus Muslim Salikov is the beginning of the card. They are the first fight of the entire thing. That is pretty fun. Both those guys are very fun to watch. But I would have to say that the prospect of the night, there's barely any. I mean, there's a lot of ranked fighters. And the ones that aren't ranked are usually older or experienced. I guess Patty Pimblett, I guess. He's like the only young guy coming off a decent win streak that's not ranked. The stake of the night, the fighter that's in hot waters, is his opponent, Tony Ferguson. Tony Ferguson's on a six-fight losing streak. If he loses again, I don't know how he sticks around. And that is a very sad story for one of the biggest fan favorites in the sport. He desperately needs a win here. I don't know if David Goggins is the guy to help with that. The fighter of the night, both guys in the main event, they're the biggest attraction to the card. They're the biggest stars on the card. Leon Edwards and Colby Covington, all eyes are going to be on these two to see who is the welterweight king. Is Colby all hype? He hasn't fought in a long time. Can he get it done? Can he silence all the doubters? Or is Leon going to prove himself to be some kind of dominant welterweight champion? There's a lot riding on that fight, man. The banger of the night, the most explosive fun fight on the card, in my opinion, is the co-main event. Alexandre Pantoja versus Brandon Royval are two guys that always have exciting fights every time you see them. Pantoja is a brawler with impeccable Brazilian jiu-jitsu skills, and Brandon Royval is a... Tasmanian devil out there. He throws everything at you you could even imagine of. One of the most creative fighters out there. And a finishing machine as well. From knockouts to submissions, he's got it all. That's going to be a very fun one. And then finally, the fight of the night. The best fight on the card. In my opinion, I think it's Shafka Rachmanov versus Steven Thompson. I think the stand-up between these two is going to be very fun to watch. And extremely technical. Now, Shafka could really make it one side if he gets it to the ground. The reason why I'm not picking the main event over this is because with Leon and Colby, it's kind of a similar dynamic there. Colby taking down Leon could control him, could control him. But then on the other way around, Leon should be the much better striker than Colby. So it's kind of like a, depending on where the fight goes, it could be one-sided regardless. But it is also a good contender for fight of the night if you pick that as well. So both that and Shafkow versus Wonderboy, I think are almost even there for the best fight. But before we go to the featured fights, let's go to the rest of the card here. If you guys like me going through the rest of the card first before the featured fights or should I do the featured fights before the rest of the card? Leave it in the comments below. Whatever you guys like, that's the way I'm going to do it. So Irina Aldana versus Carol Rosa. I'm going to go with Aldana on this one. She has the experience factor. She's a former title challenger. Very good boxing. Very big for the weight class. Hits extremely hard. Could be a bit gun shy in front of someone like Amanda Nunes, but Carol Rosa is a completely different kind of fighter. The only thing I don't like about Carol Rosa is how close her fight with Yana Santos was. And before that, she lost to Norma Dumont, but she does have some okay power as well. She's knocked down a few of her opponents. I just think in that aspect of the game, Irina Aldana's boxing should be triumphant. Then Cody Garbrandt versus Brian Kelleher. I'm going with Cody Garbrandt. He's been more active. His last fight, he looked better than he did in a long time when he fought Trevin Jones. He mixed up the game very well, used a bit more wrestling, 
and his shots were very well timed. I don't like the inactivity from Brian Keller. He hasn't fought in over a year. He's on a two fight losing streak and he got submitted very easily by both of those guys. Mario Batista and Umar. That wrestling could be a bit of a problem from Cody Garbrandt. And overall with the boxing, Cody's way faster. He's technically superior. Brian Keller has good timing with his hands, especially that lead hook. He could pump out some jabs here and there, but he's so slow with his feet and hands compared to Cody. Mix up with the wrestling, I definitely got Cody Garbrandt. Casey O'Neill versus Ariana Lipsky. Casey O'Neill has got to attempt more takedowns in this one. Ariana Lipsky does have pretty good Muay Thai skills for her skill level. That's where she wants to be the whole time. The path of least resistance for Casey O'Neill is to take the fight to the ground. She attempted a lot more takedowns earlier in her UFC career. Like for an example, a great fight to look as when she fought Antonina Shevchenko. Because Lipsky, she's got a submission on her record. She did surprise a lot of people with that knee bar against Luana Carolina. In her last couple fights, she has attempted takedowns. You could definitely tell through her overall skill set, she's becoming a much more well-rounded fighter. But I do think Casey O'Neill should be better on the ground. She has more weapons to work with here. And that Antonina Shevchenko fight is a great one to look at. Which Casey O'Neill... TKO'd her on the ground, so she has extremely high output. I think she actually has like the highest output in the whole UFC right now, and that could really translate to her ground and pound. So I definitely pick her to win this. I'm quite confident in this. Alonzo Menafield versus Dustin Jacoby. I got Dustin. I think he's just a superior striker. Alonzo Menafield did have that submission win in his last one, but he's not the greatest wrestler. Dustin Jacoby's defended plenty of takedowns throughout his career. A notable opponent was when he defended all the takedowns against Azamat Mirzakhanov, who, you know, with that last name ending with Av, a lot of people seem to think that Azamat some, like, crazy wrestler, which he really isn't. But regardless, I do expect Dustin Jacoby to defend at least most of the takedowns, and I'll strike him on the feet, make him pay for the overextending shots, land a bunch of good leg kicks, bring those up high, Keep the jab on a shorter opponent. And Dustin is very good with his counters, man. He has sharp eyes to see those big power punches coming. I'm going to go with Dustin Jacoby. From light heavyweight contenders to the flyweight contenders, Tagir Ilampakov versus Cody Durden. I'm going to go with the underdog, Cody Durden. The reason for this is Tagir has that Dagestani kind of wrestling, right? He shoots and then chain wrestles from there. His initial shot is not that strong. And Cody Durden has... Very good takedown defense. He's a great offensive wrestler himself, which also translates to his own defense. And what he's shown so far, he's the much more technical and effective boxer out of the two. And the big fight to watch is when Tagir fought Tim Elliott. Tim Elliott was able to outgrapple Tagir Lampakov. Now, Elliott is a good grappler in his own right, but Cody Durden is very underrated with his wrestling. He gets most of his takedowns when he's offensive with those, and he defends most takedowns that come at him. Has he fought a high-level wrestler like that? The only high-level wrestler he fought was Mohamed Mokayev. But Mokayev never shot a takedown in the whole fight. Cody Durden does have a bad habit of shoot against guys that go for guillotines. His last fight against Jake Hadley was a big example of that. Many takedowns he shot, and many times he almost got put into a guillotine for it. So, in this fight with Tagir, he has to keep the fight standing and trust his boxing, man. Because I think he could get it done if he does that. The dog of the card for me is Cody Durden. Andre Feely versus Lucas Almeida. Gotta go with Andre Feely with the experience. He's a pretty well-rounded striker. Not elite at anything he does, but he's good enough at all areas. He's a big featherweight. He has okay takedown defense. Enough, at least, to beat someone like Lucas Almeida, in my opinion. Martin Boudet versus Shamil Gaziev. I'm gonna go with Martin Boudet for the fact that he is bigger. Both these guys actually have a similar kind of fighting style. Pretty sloppy with the stand-up. They could both attempt takedowns. It looks like Shamil might trust his power more, but he does not react good to punches at all. There's times where you see him get hit, and he turns his back to his opponent from it. That is very bad, because Martin Boudet will definitely put the pressure on you and capitalize on those kind of moments. As soon as Martin hits Shamil, I think he could barrage him a bit. But the thing is, Shamil seems to be a little bit faster, and he might be able to mix it up when Martin is trying to put on that kind of offense on him. So it's a very close fight, in my opinion. Hard to predict, especially as a heavyweight fight between two big guys. But I'm ultimately going to go with Martin Boudet. And then finally, Randy Brown versus Muslim Salikov. This is another close fight to call. Both guys are great strikers, but they do attempt a couple takedowns here and there. Randy Brown has a lot of range and height to work with. He's a much more active striker, using that jab, using the teeps to the body, good leg kicks, will bring those up high. A lot more output from his side, whereas Muslim Salikov, he's a more of a sniper. And I think strike for strike, he definitely hits harder than Randy Brown. So he can really damage those legs, throw out a lot of leg kicks, and then eventually condition Randy Brown for a high kick. Or he can blitz in from distance, but he really has to time those, as Randy Brown will get away from him. Both guys have shown quite questionable takedown defense at times, like Lee Jin 
Young taking down Salikov or Nico Price taking down Randy Brown. You know what I'm saying? So like, I think Randy Brown has more consistent takedown defense and he has a lot more attributes to work with. So ultimately, I am going to go with the much taller and longer Randy Brown. I think the range is going to be the biggest weapon he can use in this fight. And even on the betting odds, Randy Brown is a minus 270, man. He's almost a 3-1 to one favorite over Muslim Salikov. I did not expect that much. I expect this fight to be much closer than that. And if you want to capitalize on these kind of odds, man, definitely go to mybookie.ag. They got the best lines out there. A lot of good odds on this card specifically. Like, Colby Covington now is a underdog. I'm going to get into these featured fights. But as you can see, Colby opened up as a favorite and now he's the underdog. This is a huge opportunity for anybody that is riding with Colby Covington. Or... If you're riding with Leon Edwards and you haven't bet on him yet, probably now is the better time because it looks like he's increasing as a favorite, making the rewards for betting on him less. Pantoja is a minus 180 against the plus 140 Brandon Royval. Shavka is the biggest favorite on the whole card as minus 650 over the plus 375. I'm definitely going to talk about that one. Patty Pimblett, minus 350 over the plus 225 Tony Ferguson. If you think Tony's got a shot here because you don't trust Patty Pimblett's skills, that is a very good lineup right there. But I don't expect Patty Pimblett to increase or decrease as a favorite too much. Ian Gary is the second biggest favorite on the card as minus 400 over the plus 260 Vicente Luque. Bryce Mitchell is a big favorite over Josh Emmett. Minus 210, coming in on short notice, by the way, against a interim title challenger who's fought some of the better guys of this division, Josh Emmett, who's a plus 155. There is a big age gap, but I don't know about Bryce being that big of a favorite. Arena Aldana, minus 220 over the plus 160 Carol Rosa. Cody Garbrandt, the minus 240 over the plus 170 Brian Kelleher. Casey O'Neill, the minus 190 over the plus 145 Ariana Lipsky. Dustin Jacoby's a massive favorite. Minus 270 over the plus 185 Alonzo Menafield. Tagir Ilambukov is the favorite over Cody Durden. Minus 170 over the plus 135. As you heard, I do like Cody Durden in this fight stylistically, but it's always hard to pick underdogs like that. Andre Feely, minus 180 over the plus 140 Lucas Almeida. Martin Boudet, the minus 180 over the plus 140 Shamil Gaziev. And then, of course, Randy Brown and Muslim Salikov, minus 170 to plus 185. If you want to capitalize on these odds, man, make sure you go to mybookie.ag as they're also giving you a first deposit bonus. For your first deposit, whatever you want to put in, doesn't have to be for MMA or anything. You can use it for anything you want on the my bookie website they will match up 50 percent of your first deposit all the way up to a thousand dollars so if you put like a hundred dollars they'll give you another 50 on top of that to play with and in order to activate this bonus use the promo code weasel that's w-e-a-s-l-e to take advantage of my bookie sign up offer they do come with a rollback withdrawal requirement that most of them come with remember to visit mybookie.ag today where you could win big man don't forget live betting or to put together a parlay, whatever strategy you want to go about it. Go with methods instead of the actual fighters. There's a lot of strategy involved in this. And now let's get right into the first featured fight. Josh Emmett versus Bryce Mitchell. This is an interesting fight. You could definitely tell right away the age gap. Josh Emmett is 38 years old. He looks like he might retire not too far away from now. Bryce Mitchell's 29 years old. Still not in his prime in my opinion, but he is taking this fight on short notice. You could definitely tell Josh Emmett has the much more experience fighting guys like Kelvin Cade or Dan Ige, Shane Burgos, Michael Johnson, or Carl Lamas, Mursa Bektik, good fighters throughout his career. Bryce Mitchell has like half that experience. Emmett has fought for an interim title. Bryce Mitchell's never really come close to that yet. Maybe in the future he will. And this could be a fight where he propels himself into that kind of status. But I don't like that he's taking this on short notice. He has no knockouts on his record. He's not that powerful, but he did drop Edson Barboza before, if you remember. I believe he dropped him with a 1-2. He has decent kicks. He goes with side kicks to the body and stuff, but hasn't shown to be super dangerous in the past. Josh Emmett is short enough for him to catch him with high kicks. Josh Emmett does take those sharp angles. He can move into one of those high kicks. But I do think the power from Josh Emmett is going to be very problematic for Bryce Mitchell. Those hooks and overhands, man. If he catches Mitchell with one of those, Mitchell is going to hit the deck. I don't expect Josh Emmett to take the fight to the ground. That's where Mitchell does his best work. I believe he's going to try to stuff all the takedowns. He's very short, which is naturally going to lower that center of gravity for defending takedowns. He's a good wrestler, and he's so incredibly explosive for a three-round fight too. The odds seem, in my opinion, stacked against Bryce Mitchell, if you're going to ask me. So I am definitely going to go with Josh Emmett in this one, and I'm going to go by a third-round TKO. 
almost a decision. I could even see it going three rounds. I think Josh Emmett is going to cut those angles, catch him with the overhand, catch him with a couple hooks, drop him probably once in the fight. Mitchell might catch him with a couple good strikes. He might catch him with a head kick here and there and attempt to take the fight to the ground when things start going bad for Mitchell. And I think Emmett is going to stuff most, if not all the takedowns, and eventually the damage will settle in for Bryce Mitchell. So I'm going with the underdog in this one. I'm going to go with Josh Emmett. Then we go to Vicente Luque versus Ian Machado Gary. I don't know if they're still friends. I don't know what kind of dynamic that's going to take in this fight. We've seen before, sometimes friends don't go at it too hard against each other, but sometimes they do, right? Usman and Burns definitely went at it. And we know Luke comes from that training camp. So Gary's had a lot of drama revolved around him in the past couple weeks. And as a 26-year-old with that much noise, I really wonder how he's going to deal with all of that. Is it going to make him more aggressive and he gets caught? Is it going to make him gun shy? I think stylistically though, this is a great fight for Ian Gary, especially against a declining Vicente Luque. Is it even declining at this point? He's pretty much declined. He's a pretty much a worse fighter than he used to be. The damage Vicente Luque has taken from Wonderboy and Jeff Neal have completely changed him. He is not the same guy, especially when you saw him do it against RDA. This is a guy who usually comes into a fight as a striker. He doesn't usually try to use his size and wrestling in order to win a decision against his opponent. But then again, RDA notoriously has a hard time against bigger wrestlers. So I can understand the strategy for Vicente Luque in that fight. But I really wonder if that's a permanent change in his game plan. Is that something he's going to go to more often now? Is he going to clinch up with Ian Gary against the fence, try to go for takedowns, and use his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu against them? Because Luque has some good submissions in his career. He's very underrated on the ground. Because I think on the feet, Ian Gary is going to piece him up if Luque does not get him with that one big shot. Luque has to find that left hook, the right straight, something inside of Ian Gary's defense. Because Ian Gary will drop that right hand sometimes, especially when he's looking to load it up to fire it forward. His straight right is his main weapon. And every time before he throws it, he drops it and cocks it back. There's an opening for the left hook for Luque there. Song cannot land it on Gary, as well as many other of his opponents. That's the timing Luque needs to get here. He can also land some good leg kicks against his taller and faster opponent. But at the end of the day, Luque does not move his head. Very little defense. He just picks his hands up and stands in front of you. I think Ian Gary is too sharp and too fast, too long, too powerful. He will eventually TKO Vicente Luque in the second round. Would it be awesome for Luke to get that knockout, man? That would be insane. And the odds also speak for that as well. Ian Gary's a minus 400. The same kind of thing is with Tony Ferguson and Patty Pimblett. I mean, it'd be awesome to see Tony Ferguson win this. The guy's on a six-fight losing streak, but he's made a big change. He's training with David Goggins. I mean, he's training to get infinite cardio for a three-round fight. If Tony Ferguson doesn't come out there, guns blazing the whole time, non-stop action, volume from beginning to end, I don't know why he would even train with David Goggins because he clearly does not fall short in the cardio department. He has some of the best cardio out there. I don't think he's falling short in the mental department. This guy's an absolute dog. He survived on the ground. Charles Oliveira did not even tap to that armbar. He went to sleep against Bobby Green. The only time he looked a little bit like mentally different was when he fought Benil Dariush, where he was like running away and stuff. That was weird. But other than that, the Michael Chandler performance, he didn't look mentally defeated. Against Nate Diaz, it was a little bit different. He looked like he was more buddy-buddy with Nate and he tapped out and stuff. Looked like he was in a different mental space for that fight specifically. He wasn't even mad he lost at all. But then when you look at the Bobby Green fight, which is his last one, he looked mentally there. It's just physically his skills aren't all together anymore. But here's the thing, man. I don't know how else to say it. Petty Pimblett has been quite overrated, especially with his last performance against Jared Gordon, which pretty much most people think he lost against. And Jared Gordon is not the kind of like dangerous striker, super elite in the stand-up or anything like that either. He's not great with his takedown defense like that. But then again, Petty Pimblett, not a great striker, doesn't have good wrestling. He's great on the ground if he gets you there. He could hip toss you. But the question now is, is Tony Ferguson a good enough wrestler at his state of his career to defend those kind of trips and throws? Can he defend a double leg from Petty Pimblett? I think he can. From Patty's skills, what I've seen from him, I think Tony could defend those takedowns. But can he survive the onslaught? Because Patty is very wild and powerful with his striking. He throws everything he has into every strike. And I think that could hurt Tony Ferguson. But Bobby Green lit up Tony and couldn't put him down. Tony, I think, could even punch harder than Patty. Maybe. It's just they throw punches differently. The way that Patty throws, you're always going to hit hard like that, you know? With the way Tony throws, sometimes you don't hit hard like that. You got to have natural power behind it. Tony has a big reach advantage. He has a jab he could work off of here. In close, if it gets into the clinch, He's got those nasty elbows, and I know Patty wants to get in close like that. Ultimately, my prediction for this fight, I am going to go with Patty Pimblett, but I am not writing off Tony Ferguson whatsoever here.
Tony can win. He absolutely can. For Petty to be a minus 350 is something I completely disagree with. Unless he just knocks him out right in the beginning and Tony's chin is completely gone. Then that's a different story. But I think Tony should be still tough enough, durable enough, and game enough to go back and forth with Patty Pimblett. And he has a lot of skills he could work off of here. But I am ultimately going to go with Patty Pimblett. I'm going to go by a third round TKO. Then we'll go to Shavkat Rachmanov versus Steven Wonderboy Thompson. This is going to be a very interesting fight because if Shavkat stands with Steven Thompson, he could be in trouble, man. He can land some good stuff out there, but it gives Wonderboy a real chance of winning. Shavkat sometimes does not move his head. He likes to use his reach and height as a defense, and Wonderboy can definitely bypass a lot of that stuff. He switches stances very well. He takes off good angles for his punches and kicks, shown especially in the Kevin Holland fight, who's a guy longer and taller than Shavkat. Wonderboy bypassed all of that beautifully and he showed it back in the day against Jorge Masvidal who was a quick welterweight that size step straight that he hit Jorge with was such a beautiful connection and a guy like Wonderboy can make that happen against Shavka too Shavka has to take the fight to the ground if he goes that direction drives him for the single against the wide bladed stance Wonderboy takes that lead leg drives him into the cage and trips him out from there I think Shavka should absolutely win this fight but if Shavka has got an ego about him if he thinks he can strike with Wonderboy he could pay for it. Ultimately, I am going to go with Shavkat Rachmanov. I'm going to pick him to win by a second round submission. Then we go to the co-main event. The rematch between Alexandre Pantoja versus Brandon Royval. Royval has really worked his way up. Three fight win streak against contenders Rogerio Bontarin, Matt Schnell, and Matthias Nikolaou. The last two fights against Schnell and Nikolaou especially were impressive. He's gotten put in some bad positions. He did get dropped by Matt Schnell, but the guillotine was very quick, and the flying knee against Nikolaou was quite unexpected to come out of nowhere like that. But his opponents definitely have to expect that kind of stuff out of Roy Vell. He will throw some crazy stuff at you out of nowhere. He's tried against Patosha before, and he got paid for it. Pantoja showed in their first fight, there is a clear Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gap between them two. And I think a similar kind of thing is going to happen in this fight too. You can't outdog Alexander Pantoja. If your attempt is to knock this guy out and finish him, you're probably not going to get that kind of result. If you look at his last two losses in the UFC against Askar Askarov and Davison Figueredo, Askarov literally was looking to just outpoint him, not trying to knock him out, not trying to submit him. The pace of the fight was much slower, and Asgard did a very good job of making it that kind of fight. That's a great direction to go if you want to beat someone like Pantoja. Or, with Davis and Figueredo, he tried to knock Pantoja out. He did become the only fighter in the UFC to drop him, but look who it took. It took the most powerful flyweight of all time to do it, and he didn't even knock him out either. The fight was a lot closer than people remember, so even his path to victory made it pretty close, man. Trying to bulldoze this guy and overpower him is a very hard way to beat someone like Pantoja, and Royvelle fights everybody like he is trying to finish you. There's a jiu-jitsu gap. Pantoja has an iron chin, a lot of heart. He's extremely difficult to finish, and Royvelle's never gone five rounds in his entire career, the way he fights sometimes, I'm surprised he can even go three rounds like that, let alone five, you know what I'm saying? So I think in the later rounds, if it goes that far, Pantoja is definitely going to take over this fight. And I think he's going to try to get the fight to the ground. Royvel's had questionable takedown defense. I mean, Bontarin took him down a lot, but Bontarin's a very big physical guy. Pantoja took him down three times in their fight. Moreno took him down. Tim Elliott took him down quite a bit of times. I think at the end of the day, Alexander Pantoja is going to implement the same kind of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gap close to the last fight. So I'm going to go with Pantoja, and I'm going to go by a third round submission. And then we go to the main event. A very close fight among the fans, among the odds, and even the fighters that have an opinion on this. Leon Edwards versus Colby Covington. This is a fight we've been wanting to see for a long time, and it's finally going to happen. A simple way to look at this fight is that point fighters or even snipers with relatively low output generally have a hard time with high volume, fast pace, pressure fighters. They get crowded and overwhelmed so much that they can't find their openings that they want, and before they know it, they're already in bad positions. Striker versus grappler in a way. I mean, both guys can do the opposite, right? Leon can grapple. He's definitely improved a lot over the years in that department, and Colby can strike. He's not like a super technical striker, but he can overwhelm you with output and the funkiness of his boxing. He has some good body kicks. They landed on Usman. He can come up over the top with good head kicks as well. He can attack you with spinning back fist like he did back in the day. I think he landed that on Jonathan Munir. The only thing about Colby Covington though is he's been dropped quite a bit of times in his last four fights, but he did take a lot of time off in between those fights to allow himself to recover. So he got dropped twice and finished against Usman in 2019. He took almost a year off before he fought Tyron Woodley and didn't take damage 
in that fight. Then he got dropped twice against Kamaru Usman in 2021, waited out like half a year before he fought Jorge, and he got dropped in that fight too. But ever since that fight, it's been almost two years since Colby has fought. When he came back against Robbie Lawler after he beat Rafa dos Anjos, it was over a year layoff. He looked very good against that declining former champion. He usually takes like a year off between his fights, and he never looks ring rusted. So I do expect Colby Covington to also enter this fight with Leon in good form. Now, if it stays standing long enough, Leon is going to get the timing of Colby and probably hurt him at some point of the fight. Colby cannot give him too many openings without shooting takedowns, and the takedowns cannot all be the same setups. Leon is very good at calculating your movements, and I could see him potentially landing a knee, I could see him landing some kind of high kick from range, I could see him landing an elbow in the clinch if Colby rises up into that. Leon's not normally like a knockout artist he's been more of a point fighter throughout his career but he but he has shown occasionally they could definitely put you down with a precise shot he's very precise with a lot of stuff that he throws mostly his kicks and knees and elbows his punches can sometimes be questionable there are times he swings that check hook and it's just like Mike Perry's throwing it or something. That's how Nate Diaz was able to catch him with the one-two. That hook that Leon threw came from the bleachers. I don't know why he threw it that wide and he did it multiple times in their fight. If he does that against the also solid Paul Colby Covington, Colby can land the same kind of one-two or a jab overhand and take him down from there. Leon usually likes to fight in the southpaw stance to open up his left kick which I think is his dominant kick. But in this one, if he wants to take that same kind of thing, he's going to switch to orthodox and time the right kick instead. But if he switches into the opposite stance, he's going to give Colby Covington the lead leg for takedowns. Their lead legs are going to be right in front of each other, closer proximity to Colby to grab onto it. He shoots the single, can get his head on the outside, potentially try to get to his back. And we do know that Leon Edwards likes to give his back up to stand up. Now, there's been quite a few fighters that haven't capitalized on that. There's been only a couple good grapplers throughout his career that have taken him to the the ground and have good jiu-jitsu like Vicente Luque has decent jiu-jitsu he took him down a couple times Donald Cerrone has good jiu-jitsu he took him down like once Gunnar Nelson took him down a couple times and also Leon did drop him but that's a long time ago right Leon's advanced a lot since then Colby Covington has better wrestling than all of those guys. He has a better ability to take down Leon than all of those guys. His wrestling's different than Usman's, where it's a lot more pressuring. He's a lot more relentless with his shots. He drives way better. Usman's legs have just been deteriorating over the years. Colby's has not. Colby's going to have the best shot at taking Leon down, keeping him down, getting his back, potentially trying to choke him out like he tried against Jorge Mazda, who has great Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu defense. And every single movement that Leon gives him to try to stand up, Colby is fast enough to change the angles, change the grip, turn it into a different takedown, and keep him on the ground as long as possible while landing ground upon shots and looking for the choke whenever Leon gives up his back. So ultimately, my prediction for this fight, I'm going to go with the underdog here. I'm going to go with Colby Covington. I think his wrestling style could be worse for Leon than Kamar Usman's was. He will expose himself a lot with his striking, so he definitely cannot keep himself there long. But I think he understands that as well. So I see him jabbing forward, fainting forward, not being too reckless in the open, trying to back up Leon Edwards, which he actually does himself. Leon all the time actually backs up. And Colby faking the takedowns, faking the punches, throw two punch combinations as soon as Leon backs up to the cage and transitions that into a takedown. I think he should be able to get him to the ground control them enough, and ultimately win this fight through a decision. So I hope you guys enjoyed the predictions, and if you did, make sure you give this a like, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, leave in comments below what your guys' predictions for this card are, and I'll see you guys in the next video.